we're studying how the nervous system generates behavior. And the nervous system has to process sensory information and translate that sensory information in a coordinated motor output, usually by coordinating different independent motor programs. And for instance, if you try to swat a fly, if a fly flies away, it actually has to coordinate its leg lift and its wing flapping just to avoid being actually uh, crushed by a fly swatter. C. elegans does something very similar in the escape response. It moves in a sinusoidal motion, and on top of that, it also moves its head back and forth to sample its microenvironment. Now, if you touch the animal just behind the head with an eyelash, then the animal will start backing up, and during this backing, it will actually suppress these head movements. And at the end of the reversal, it will uh, turn around and move away from the stimulus and resume these head movements. And there are also other mutants, actually, that we've identified that uh, fail to suppress these head movements in response to touch. The great thing about C. elegans is that we know a tremendous amount of detail about the neural circuit. Uh, we know exactly how all the neurons are connected, what kind of synapses and gap junctions they make. So we know how the sensory information flows in the nervous system. And the C. elegans touch response is actually one of the very few examples where we know the complete path of sensory neuron to interneuron to motor neuron. So we know exactly the underlying structures that control behavior. The one thing that we actually do not know very well uh, is the why of the behavior. So why would the animal suppress these head movements in response to a touch just behind the head? But actually, it does not suppress these head movements when you touch it at the tail or at the tip of the nose. In the laboratory, we grow C. elegans on agar plates. But in the wild, uh, C. elegans thrives in, in decaying organic matter. So some of the main predators of uh, nematodes in the wild are these predaceous fungi. And these predaceous fungi they have developed uh, very sophisticated hyphal structures to, to catch nematodes. And the most ingenious one is, is the one that uses constricting rings. And these, these hyphal rings consist of three cells. And when a nematode comes along and moves through this ring, then the, the mechanical stimulation of the ring cells leads these rings to inflate and entrap the nematode. And eventually, hyphae will actually perforate the cuticle of the worm, and the worm will be digested by the fungus. While trap inflation occurs quickly once started, uh, there's delay from the initial contact of the worm with the inside of the trap and ring inflation. And this allows the animal a small time window to carefully uh, retract and escape from uh, a trap. The beauty of the elegance is uh, that you can do genetics. So there are all kinds of mutants available. You can make transgenics. There, you can use green fluorescent markers to label certain populations. So now we can really test the contributions of different genes uh, in a predator-prey interaction. We performed a competition assay where we mixed populations of wild-type worms and mutant worms, one of them labeled with a green fluorescent marker. What we found was that animals that couldn't suppress their head movements were caught much more efficiently than the wild worms by these fungi, indicating that suppression of head movements may provide a selective advantage to surviving fungal encounters in the natural environment. This raises the intriguing possibility that maybe this behavior has evolved as, as a result of selective pressures that have been imposed by predaceous fungi. And that maybe uh, the constricting ring and the suppression of head movements are part of an evolutionary arms race. Since we know the molecular and neuronal basis of this behavior in C. elegans, we can now look at these receptors and neurotransmitters in other species to get an idea maybe how this behavior has uh, evolved.